Amen. All right. Let's have a little singing this morning. Miss Justin, Miss Samantha, I want you to come. And uh, these three sisters are going to sing something for you this morning. And we'll see what the Lord has to do. Amen. Amen.
that. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. No more trouble, no more trial. Amen. And the object of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be saved. Yeah. I'm excited. Amen. Looking Amen. forward to it. And uh, ready to go. Was ready to go a long time ago. Yeah. 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 Made my reservation. Uh, this May will be 28 years. Uh, I made my reservation for heaven. Yeah. And the older I get, and the longer I live, yeah. the less I care about this world. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's true. As you get older, you, you, you learn that everything that glitters ain't gold. Yeah. Uh, Amen. You know, all of that shiny stuff the world right. tries to tell you is wonderful. You, yeah. you begin to learn that it ain't. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that matters is Jesus. Amen. The only thing. Everything else, I don't mount to a hill. There's nothing else ever satisfied me. Yeah. That's right. But Jesus. Yeah. Only yeah. thing I know, listen, I tried everything. Uh, they said, make a bunch of money. I did that. Didn't satisfy me. They said, uh, you know, uh, try alcohol or, or dope or whatever. And I found this to be true, that none of those things ever satisfied. Right. Yeah. But oh, when I met the Savior, yeah. Lord, mercy. Yeah. For the first and only time in my life, I knew what true satisfaction and contentment was. And here we are nearly 28 years later, I'm still satisfied. Yeah. Jesus told that woman at the well, he said this. He said, he that drinketh of the water that I shall give, He'll never thirst you. Right. I'm satisfied this morning with Jesus. Yeah. I'm grateful for him. Second Samuel chapter number nine. And uh, I want to try to uh, help you this morning and preach what God's given me. Second Samuel chapter number nine. Now, we're going to read the entire chapter. And so you'll get, listen, you say, I ain't read my Bible today. Well, you're fixing it. <laughs> Don't worry, it ain't the 13 verses. <clears throat> One of the shortest chapters. But my soul is it jam-packed. Oh, yeah. Uh, second, uh, uh, second Samuel chapter number 9. Please. And uh, I want to try to give you what the Lord uh, has given me. And so we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And the Bible says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may shew him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may shew him, that I may shew the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of a meal, in Lodibar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of a meal, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely shew thee kindness. Hang on, my page is stuck together. <laughs> for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant? that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore, and thy sons, and thy servants, shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits, that, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, 
For he did eat continually at the king's table and was laying on both his feet. Let's pray. Father, this morning we sure are grateful to be in church. Thank you, Lord. One day after a while, this will be just a memory. Lord, I'm grateful that we're, so, we're your people and we're going somewhere. Lord, I'm looking forward to getting home. But Lord, until that day, I pray you to help us. Help us to stand. Help us to preach. Help us to love your people. Help us to, to uh, desire to see the salvation of sinners. Lord, help us to be about your business. Now, Father, this morning I realize what I am. I know what I am. Lord, I, I, I'm under no illusions this morning. Lord, I know I'm unworthy of the slightest blessing of heaven. I know in this flesh dwelleth no good thing. Lord, I know I don't have the ability or capability of doing anything. And so, Father, if anything gets done this morning, you'll have to be the doer of it. Simply because I cannot. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. That's certainly true. And so, Lord, we're going to lean on you, depend on you, rest in you. We're going to uh, trust you and believe you. And, Lord, we ask you that you touch us and honor us and help us. Use us this morning. Father, I pray just as importantly, Lord, you speak unto the heart of the listener. May you encourage our hearts this morning. Remind us of these great truths. And, Father, whatever you do for us, we'll be careful. We'll give you all the praise and honor and glory if you're the only one worthy. We love you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your people. Thank you for another chance to gather in thy name. I pray you'd bless it. May you help us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Here we are introduced to the grandson of the former king, King Saul. His father, Jonathan, uh, was the son of Saul. And uh, Jonathan was best friends with the current king, David. David feels impressed to help the family of Saul. And he asks this question, Is there any left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? Now, when you study this passage, throughout the rest of the story, you will find that David the king pours out repeated and continual blessings on Mephibosheth. Right. Even though this man didn't do anything to deserve these blessings, even though he was unworthy of these blessings, even though uh, the king didn't owe this individual anything, the entire story uh, you'll find is a picture of the grace of God Amen. toward an undeserving sinner. Amen. Even though you and I don't deserve anything. Right. Even though you and I are unworthy of the slightest blessing of God. Right. God keeps pouring His out keeps pouring out His blessings over and over and over on us. When we study this text, we can certainly see ourselves that how God has given grace to you and I. Uh, when we look at the particulars of this story, there is grace oozing from every single detail. Our hope and prayer is this morning that through this story, we'll see just how God has been good to us. And we'll see just how much grace God has poured upon us and uh, just how unworthy we are of all of His blessings. Yeah. This morning, I simply want to preach on this fall. Grace. Mm -hmm. Just grace. Yeah. Now you'll know that you know that grace is the unmerited favor of a holy God right. towards sinful and undeserving humanity. Grace is not only extended in our story, but we also find it is necessary for Mephibosheth to have any kind of interaction with the king. Right. Now the same is true for the sinner to even know his creator. Any interaction between God and man is always a result of God's grace. Right. Anytime God interacts with man, anytime God blesses him, anytime God reveals himself right. to, to that sinner, right. anytime God is kind and blesses that individual, it is always, without exception, the grace of God. Right. Anytime God forgives, and draws an individual to it. It is grace. Uh, we observe this principle uh, as early as the book of Genesis. We read that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Right. God reveals Himself to Noah. And He gives him instructions uh, to the saving of his household. It was grace that God dealt with him. It was grace that showed him the flood was coming. It's grace that reveals God's plan for the right. And it was grace that gave him the pattern of the ark and how to build it. Right. It was grace that helped him to preach and build for 120 years. Yeah. While the entire world is under the judgment of God, Noah finds grace. Right. Uh, while the entire world is condemned, Noah finds grace. 
While the entire world is mocking and laughing, Noah finds grace. While, that, while the world is drowning in a flood, Noah is high and dry by the grace of Almighty God. This morning, God's grace is not only uh, displayed in our lives, but it is also abundant in our lives. Right. The reason you're here this morning, the grace of God. Right. The reason God kept you safe last night while you slept in your bed, it was the grace of God. Right. It was grace that kept your heart beating. Yeah. It was grace that protected you. It was grace that right. allowed you to get out of bed under right. your own power. And it was grace that allowed you to come safely yeah. to the church house. Yeah. It'll be grace that gets us home this yeah. afternoon. It'll be grace that brings us back tonight. I just want to stop and say thank God, thank God, Amen. thank God for grace this morning. Right. Though I'm unworthy, though I'm undeserving, though God don't owe me anything, yet He has poured His grace upon my life and upon my family abundantly over and over and over. I've experienced the blessings of Almighty God and you say, why? It's all because of grace. Right. So this morning I want to point out several things to you. And try to be a help and a blessing to you. Number one, I want you to see the recipient of grace. In the text, we find out several things about Mephibosheth. We find he was lame in verse number three. You'll find that, uh, that the king calls Ziba and questions him about the house of Saul. And he tells him that Saul had a grandson, Jonathan's boy, and he is lame on his feet. We find that he was lame. That means he could not walk. Because he was lame, he could not get himself to the king. But because of grace, the king came to him. When he couldn't get to the king, the king came to him. And because he was lame, he couldn't go searching for the king. But even though he was lame, uh, the king came searching for him. And this morning, because of the grace of God, the king searched him out and found him and blessed him. Yeah. Now, you realize this morning, you and I are lame. Uh, spiritually speaking, we cannot walk with God. Uh, there's not a sinner on the planet that can walk in God, walk with God of their own merit. Right. And so, uh, but by grace, God walks with us. It's the grace of God that allows us to walk with Him and talk with Him and fellowship with the Holy God. Outside of the grace of God, we could not know God. And we certainly could not walk with God. Right. But, it's, but, but we are, listen, we're far too lame to reach Him and fellowship with Him. But because of grace, you and I can have a relationship right. with the Creator of the universe, the one who spoke the world into existence, the one who slung the, slung the, the stars off the end of His finger tips and created that beautiful sky you saw last night. You and I can walk with that same God. You and I can know that same God. You and I can be benefited by that same God. Right. And because of grace, we can have a relationship with Him. We can have heaven as a whole and we don't have to die and go to hell. That's enough to shout about it all the way home to heaven that I'm not going to hell. You say, why? Because you're a preacher? No. You say, why? Because you're tired? No. You say, why are you going to heaven then? It's all because of the grace of Almighty God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah. And so you'll find he's he's lame. Can I show you something? You will find his fall was the fault of another. Second yeah. Samuel chapter number four. Flip back a few pages, and I want to show you this. You will find that his fall was the fault of another. Look at 2 Samuel 4, verse 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. His fall wasn't his fault. It was his nurse's fault. And even though his fall wasn't his fault, yet he still had to bear the consequences of the fall. And the same is true for you and I. Our fall wasn't our fault. But it was the fault of another. Right. When Adam and Eve plunged, uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, they plunged every human being that would come after them into sin. Their rebellion against God 
cause all of us to be laying on our feet. And we are bearing the consequences of Adam and Eve's fall. And that's why we go to funerals. That's why we have hospitals. That's why they, I, you have to go to the doctor. I, you know why? Because of the fall. It ain't my fault that I'm, I'm falling. It's the fault of another. I, but hear me, even though it's not my fault, I still have to bear the consequences of Adam and Eve. Hear me. I, you'll find I, that Adam and Eve fell and their sin separated. You and I from God and plunged us into depravity. Every right. modern low down thing on this planet. Right. Every, every bit of hatred. Every bit of rape and murder. I ever bit of uh, nonsense and robbery and thievery. Every war uh, is all a result of the fall of Adam and Eve. Right. You are living in a sin cursed planet. Yeah. You are living in a sin cursed body. And it's not our fault, but we still have to bear the consequences right. of the fall. Right. Now, You'll find in spite of his condition, the king loved him and helped him and cared for him. My, how gracious our God has been to love us and care for us and provide for us even though we are lame. You realize that because of grace, God has given us all that we need to walk with Him. I want you to notice His dwelling. In 2 Samuel 9, 4, the Bible says... He's living down in Lodibar. Lodibar means the house of no bread. You will find Mephibosheth was poor. And because, of he, because of his poverty, he had nothing to offer the king. Okay. But the king gave him everything. Right. Yeah. He's a poor man standing in the palace talking with and enjoying the presence of the king. Right. He's from a place of no bread, yet he's feasting at the king's table. You say, what is that? That's just grace. Right. Here's a man that's got nothing. He yeah. can't do nothing. He yeah. got nothing. But the king comes looking for him, finds him, rescues him, brings him to the palace, right. sets him at his own table, and feeds him all the days of his life. Here you say, what is that? It's just grace. Yeah. You know what we're doing this morning? You and I are gathered around the king's table, and God is feeding us uh, day after day, uh, Sunday after Sunday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You and I are walking in and living in the good grace of God. Right. Hear me, though we be lame, though God knows us right. nothing, thank God, thank God yeah. that God displays His grace toward the undeserving, right. toward the unworthy, through, uh, to those who don't deserve nothing but to die and go to hell. Yeah. I mean the worst of the worst, the sorriest of the sorriest, though we be poor, we got nothing to offer the King. The right. King loved us and came to us yeah, and saved us by His grace. So we see the recipient of this grace. But I want you to see the reason for this grace. Mephibosheth didn't do anything to deserve grace. He did not earn it. He did not merit it. He was lame. He was separated from the king. He was not just separated from the king. He was considered an enemy. You will find throughout the Old Testament that normally when a new king took over the throne, he would kill all of the former king's family. Why would he do that? So they would not try to take the throne from the new king. You will find Mephibosheth is considered an adversary. He is considered hostile against the new king. Then how could this enemy be treated so kindly? Why would this king be so good to this adversary? Why would he care for and love this individual that was considered a hostile foe? The reason the king loved him had nothing to do with the merit of Mephibosheth. Right. The reason David loved him and, and was a blessing to him was because of someone else. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You will find that David had made a covenant yeah. with Mephibosheth's father. Jonathan. Look at verse number one, if you would. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time of, uh, I'm in the wrong chapter. Uh, look at verse number one, chapter nine. And David said, Is there any yet, uh, any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? Notice this, for Jonathan's sake. Yeah. Mephibosheth didn't merit the goodness of the right. king. It wasn't Mephibosheth's work, it wasn't Mephibosheth's 
uh, uh, abilities. The sole reason was that Mephibosheth uh, was uh, treated good and right. loved and blessed and taken care of was because of someone else. Right. You see, Jonathan did the work, but Mephibosheth got the blessing. Yeah. Right. Jonathan paid the price, but Mephibosheth enjoys all of the blessings. May I remind you this morning the reason you and I can experience the grace of God is not because of who we are, right. but it's because of someone else yeah. who loved us, gave his life for us, suffered, bled, and died. Hear me. Jesus did the work, and you and I are reaping the benefits. Jesus paid the price while you and I are living in the grace of Almighty God. It's not because of what we've done, it's all because of what right. someone else did who loved us and cared for us. Jonathan loved David. Jonathan blessed David. Jonathan died. I did the work. But yet the finisher is reaping the benefit. Right. Yeah. You will find when the king goes looking for Mephibosheth, Jonathan has died. If Jonathan is not dead, then Mephibosheth doesn't get the benefits. Yeah. May I remind you this morning that God's grace in our lives is not because we merit it or we deserve it. Yeah. It's because someone else paid the price. Right. Yeah. And Jesus at the cross did the work. And Jesus at the cross had to die. And if Jesus, if Jesus doesn't die, then you and I cannot experience the grace of Almighty God. We were in the land of no bread. We were poor spiritually. We had nothing to offer the people. But because our Savior died, we are reaping the grace of God and the blessings of God. God's been good to us, not because of who we are, but because of what His Son did. This morning, God is satisfied with Calvary. Yeah. And the Lord, all of His wrath, all of His fury, all of His judgment, He pours out on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? So He would not have to pour it out on you and me. And God treated His Son as if He were us. Why? So He could treat us as if we were His Son. And we had no righteousness. We had no goodness. And so Jesus dies. And he, when we got saved, God took the righteousness and the goodness of Jesus Christ and imparted it to us. And now you and I can stand before God just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we have been clothed in the right Righteousness of Christ because of Calvary. His blood was shed that you and I might enjoy the good blessings. Right. Right. Now, may I say this the cross is the reason you're not going to hell. Yeah. The cross is the reason you're saved. The cross is the reason you're blessed. The cross is the reason God can and does answer your prayer. The cross is the reason we have heaven as a home. And Jesus is why you and I are seated at the king's table. Amen. But number three, I want you to see the reach of grace. We find that it was grace that sought Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth didn't go looking for the king, but the king went looking for him. Amen. You will find there is a servant that shows up. His name is Ziba. He's a type of the Holy Ghost. When the king wanted to show kindness to Mephibosheth, he sent Ziba to go find him and to fetch him and to bring Mephibosheth to the king. Verse 5 in 2 Samuel 9 says this, Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machen, the son of Emil from Lodibar. God sent Ziba to go get him. The king didn't leave his palace. He sent Ziba. Ziba's a type of the Holy Ghost. Right. Listen, the Lord Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen. But He sent the good Holy Ghost to come and fetch you and me. Yeah. He sent the Spirit of God to fetch us and bring us to the King. I can picture there's Mephibosheth. He's sitting in poverty. He lives in a shack. He hears something outside and he looks out the window there he sees the carriage pull up. 
Fear fills his heart. He thinks the king's going to kill me. Yeah. I am an enemy. I am an adversary to the king. And Ziba knocks on his door. He yells through the door, <coughs> Mephibosheth, the king has sent me to bring you to him. He, Mephibosheth says, open the door. I can't, I can't get up. Ziba walks in, picks up Mephibosheth, carries him out to the chariot, into the carriage, and they start toward the palace. Ziba says, Mephibosheth, the king wants to see you. Now, maybe Ziba sees the fear on his face. He says, listen, calm down, man. The king wants to rescue you. The king wants to help you. I can only Im imagine there's Mephibosheth. He's dirty. His garments are tattered. I mean, he is unclean. Right. He looks at Ziba and says, Man, I wish I could clean up before I see the king. Ziba said, Don't worry. He'll take you just like y'all. Don't worry about cleaning up. The king will take care of you. Right. He said, But I'm dirty and I'm lame. He says, Oh, Mephibosheth, you don't have to worry about that. The king will clean you up. He'll give you a new garment. He'll seat you at his table. And he'll take care of you. You just come just like you are. The king don't care what you look like. The king don't care what you got. The king don't care about your poverty. The king ain't worried about your, how dirty you are. Right. The king ain't worried about how, how your garment is stained. Yeah. You just come with me. I'm going to take you to the king. Right. And old Mephibosheth sits there. And they pull up in front of the palace. And uh, listen, uh, Mephibosheth can't get to the king. No, Zebra walks around and scoops him up and cradles him in his arms. And he walks through the front door of the palace. He walks by the guards. He walks by the servants. All of those who are waiting in line. To right. talk to the king, he bypasses them all. And old Ziba carries him right into the throne room of King David and says, Here, I'm going to set you right here. He ushers him into the very presence of the king. Thank God this morning I did not have to wait. But when I cried out, the good Holy Ghost carried me right into the throne room of Jesus Christ and introduced me to the king of glory. He didn't care what it looked like. Yeah. He didn't care that I was dirty. He didn't care that I had nothing to offer him. Yeah. He didn't care that I was impoverished and broken yeah. and I couldn't do nothing for him. Yeah. The king took me just like I was. Yeah. I'm glad, thank God, Jesus don't expect us to clean up before we come to the king. Yeah. Listen, you ain't got to clean up. You just come to the king. Yeah. The king will take care of all of that. Right. I can imagine as he ushers him into the presence of the king, I, Mephibosheth, we know he's still scared. We know he's still worried because he says this, why would the king show kindness to such a dead dog as I am? Yeah. I can picture him as they set him in a chair. Mephibosheth realizes he is unworthy. He realizes he is unclean. And he realizes he has nothing to offer the king. He's lame. He's defenseless against the king. All of a sudden, the king turns. Here's the king, a royal crown upon his head, wearing his royal robes, clean and spotless. And he looks upon Mephibosheth and stares at him. And when he does, Mephibosheth thinks, Oh no, I'm in trouble. And the king all of a sudden is staring at him. He's looking over him. He sees that he's lame. He sees that he's dirty. He sees that he is unworthy. He sees that he, is, he has nothing to offer him. He sees his poverty. And he knows who he, who he is. He knows where he's been. He knows what he's done. And he stares at Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth just looks up at him. And all of a sudden, the king breaks out in a smile and says, I'm glad you're here. I want to take care of you. I want to bless you. I want to help you. My, what relief. Right. the soul of Mephibosheth. I remember when I got introduced to the king. Right. I I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was guilty. I knew I was in trouble. But when I came to the king, he smiled upon me and loved me and saved me and washed me 
made clean and put a new garment upon them. Right. Now, this morning, we have seen the recipient of grace. We have seen all that Mephibosheth was. We've seen the reason for grace. Somebody paid the price for him to be blessed. We've seen the reach of grace. Here's this old boy way down in the lowly bar. Nobody even hardly knows he's there. Right. But the king does. Yeah. The king knows where he's at. The king knows what kind of shape he's in. And the king was looking for him. The king reached out. You realize this morning God didn't, didn't owe you nothing. God could have left you yourself and let you die and go to hell and he'd still be in God. You said, why did he, why did he stop because of grace? Why did he come to us? I'm talking about blasphemers and liars and fornicators and drunkards and dopeheads and uh, I mean just the wicked, the most wicked crowd on the planet. Why would God bother to fool with us? Why would God come to where we were? Why would God treat us so kindly? Why would God love us when we didn't love Him? Right. Why would God care about what we were? And why would God bother uh, to mess with a whole bunch of sorry, uh, good for nothing, impoverished, dirty, a rotten sinners who were enemies against God. Uh, we were at enmity, the Bible says. Right. But while we were enemies, uh, God came looking for us. He didn't come to smile us. He come to bless us. He didn't come to ruin us. He come to redeem us. And He shows up where you and I were. And He dealt with our hearts and saved us by His grace. Right. There's no place where you'll ever be that grace cannot reach you. Amen. You'll find that reach of grace can reach the lowest valley. That grace can go to the most wicked place on this planet and snatch up the most undeserving sinner and save them by His grace. Amen. Now I can picture the king calls the servant and says, hey, get that garment off of him. That's dirty. That's filthy. He don't need that. Matter of fact, y'all carry him in the back so you can take a bath. And while he's taking a bath, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go get the finest robe. And I want you to lay it beside the tub that when he gets out of the tub, he'll be put on the finest robe. Did you, really, did you hear what, the, what, what David said? I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Let, let me not get ahead of myself. But you'll find... Uh, look at verse number 11. Look at the end of the verse. This is what it says. Uh, it said the king, He shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Yeah. Right. The king said, I'm going to treat him just like my son. Amen. Do you realize that's what Jesus does for you and I? Amen. He treats us as though we were righteous even though we're unrighteous. He treats us though we are good, though we are no good. Right. And God, because He has adopted us into the family of God, He now treats us as one of His sons. Amen. I'm just talking about grace, man. Amen. He didn't work for it. He didn't get baptized for it. He didn't join the church for it. He didn't clean, do landscaping. He didn't work around the palace. No, sir. He enjoyed every good blessing without lifting a single finger to do anything. And that's exactly what we do when we get saved by grace and God dumps His blessings on us. Yeah. Right. You'll see the reach of grace. But can I say this? Mephibosheth was adopted by the king. That's great. But notice this. The king tells Ziba, from now on, I want you to take care of it. Look at verse 9. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring him the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. 
But Mephibosheth, I master your son shall eat bread always at my table. You'll find that King David uh, enlists Ziba to take care of Mephibosheth. He said, Ziba, I sent you to fetch him and bring him to me. Now that I've talked with him, now that everything is made right between he and I, I've adopted him into my family. He is, is as one of my sons. He said, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go with him, and everywhere he goes, you go. Everything he needs, you take care of it. You will do the work, and he will reap the blessing. You know what the Holy Ghost does for you and I after we're saved? What a picture, man, of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost fetched us and brought us to Jesus, yeah. introduced us to the, to the Lamb of God who was slain in Calvary. And once we have been introduced, and once we have been saved, once we have been cleaned up, once we have been redeemed by the grace of God, the same Holy Ghost that brought us to Him, He tells that same servant, He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go with Him. I want you to do the work. I want you to do the labor. I want you to take care of Him. I want you to provide for Him. You know what the Holy Ghost has been doing for me ever since the day I met Him? He is walked with me and been my friend. I ain't never done nothing. Any good thing I've ever done, the Spirit of God had to do it for me. If the Spirit of God wouldn't nudge my heart, I wouldn't read my Bible. If the Spirit of God didn't nudge my heart, I wouldn't pray. If the Spirit of God didn't nudge my heart, I could not be faithful. He's doing all the work. But I listen, one day after a while when I get home, you and I reap the benefits of it. He said, listen, you till the ground and you bring in the fruits. It was all Ziba. May I remind you, Mephibosheth is lame. He needed somebody to go with him and to help him and to labor for him. And that's what the Holy Ghost does for you and I all the way home to glory. I am not a self-made man. The Lord saved me put the Holy Ghost inside of me. And He's been doing the work through me all these years. And this morning, that's what He's doing for you. You couldn't even love God right if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost. Right? You certainly couldn't make a difference for God. You certainly wouldn't be faithful to God. The only reason we are is because He gave us a helper. He gave us somebody to do the work through us that He could use us and be a benefit. Hear me, I've heard some wonderful preaching through the years, but hear me, I am under no illusion. It ain't that preacher. It's the Holy Ghost right. that, that dwells in that preacher. He's the one doing the work. He's the one doing the blessing. Hear me, I don't see this stuff on myself. You said what happened. The Spirit of God nudged me and said, look at this. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. I wouldn't even have nothing to preach this morning if it wasn't for the good Holy Ghost. Right. Hear me this morning. He is doing the work through you. Right. Don't grieve Him. Don't quench Him. Don't hinder Him. Allow Him to work and bless in your life. It will bear fruit down the road. Amen. He said, I want, the, I want the Ziba to plow it up. And I want Ziba to bear the fruit. If you do any fruit bearing, it ain't really you. It's Him yeah. bearing yeah. fruit through you. Yeah. You say, why? Grace. Yeah. Just grace. Yeah. This morning... <clears throat> You will find in verse 13, Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he didn't eat continually at the king's table. Notice this. He's still laying on both his feet. He ate continually at the king's table and was laying on both his feet. In spite of being lame, he was still feasting at the king's table. Why, Grace? That grace is extended because of the actions of another, yeah. the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And even though I am still lame, I am feasting at the King's table. Amen. Everything God has ever done or ever will do for me is because of grace. Yeah. Yeah. Not because I've earned it, because I deserve it. Right. But lastly, I want you to see the reigning of grace. Grace now reigns in the heart of the believer. Because Christ has died and rose again, grace can reign in our lives and in our hearts. No matter how much grace we need, there's always more than enough. Grace for you and me. You cannot, it is impossible for you to diminish God's supply of grace. God will never run out of grace. You will find in the Bible He's called the God of all grace. 1 Peter 5.10 says this, But the God of all grace, 
who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthened, and settled you. You will find His grace reigns over sin. Amen. The Bible says this in Romans 5, 20, more over the law in it, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Verse 21 says this, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Corinthians 9 8 says this, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Jesus goes to the cross, does battle with sin, he walks away victorious. His victory brought grace to the throne and now that same grace can abound in our lives. I looked up that word abound in an 1828 dictionary. This is what the definition was. It says to have or possess in great quantity. To be copiously supplied. To be in great plenty. To be very evident. Then it says this. It means to be under a wave. And I thought, my God, how many times have you and I had the waves of grace roll over us? Amen. Through all of our faults and all of our failures, when God should have cast us aside and forgot about us. Yeah. But instead, we are under a wave of grace. Yeah. Those girls saying they sung it the other night. I'm, I'm talking about the grace of God. They said, I'm drowning in it. Hear me this morning. God has grace. And God's grace abounds towards you and I. Do we deserve it? No. Should He cast us aside? Yes. But He does not. Why? Because of grace. When you're not everything you should be, when you fail the Lord miserably, there is grace for you and me. Thank God for grace. Right. Maybe you've not failed Him like I have, but I have been a miserable failure in the sight of Almighty God, and yet I'm still I'm living under a wave of grace. Right. There is grace yeah. that will reign over sin. It's grace that restores and grace that forgives when we fall and when we falter. You will find grace reigns over suffering. When our hearts are broken and tears fill our eyes, when sorrow surrounds us, there's grace to get us through the difficult times of this life. When we stand at the graveside of a loved one, we find peace and strength. That's grace. When those we love turn their backs on us, and we can press on for the glory of God, that's grace. When the bills are high and the funds are low, there's grace. Amen. Through the sorrow and sickness and sadness and through the struggles of this world, there is grace. 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 Marvelous grace. Amen. I like what the Bible, what, the, the, what the, the old song said, John Newton wrote it. He said, through many dangers, tools, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far. Yeah. And grace will lead me home. Yeah. It ain't no wonder they call it amazing. Yeah. How could you and I, the low down sorry wretches, yeah. right. violated the commands of God, wicked and ungodly, had no use for God, turned our backs on God? How can it be that you and I are living under a wave of grace and enjoy the good blessings of God and with healthy families, no good jobs, money in our pocket, a warm roof over our head? Uh, listen, and God stumped His blessing after blessing upon our lives. I do say, how could God be so good to you and me? It's all all because of grace this morning. It is grace. It's all grace. And it's always going to be grace. Right. You and I don't deserve anything. Right. I say this regularly. You and I have done some stuff since we've been saved. Right. God has sent us to hell for it. You say, why aren't we going? Because of grace. Yeah. For by grace are you saved. Yeah. 
through faith. And that not of yourself is the gift of God. God saw you all messed up and fouled up. God saw you smoking dope, drinking liquor, living like a devil. And instead of smiting you with the wrath of God, God came to you in love and tenderness, brought you to a place of repentance, saved you and cleansed you, washed you clean from your filthiness, and did for you what no one else could do, and saved you, forgave you, loved you, put you in the house of God, put a King James Bible under your arm, blesses you over and over and over and over again when really He should cast us aside for our failures and our inability and our rebellion and our refusal to follow Him and to do what He tells us to do. But yet, instead of casting us aside, He loves us and helps us and puts up with us when we deserve to be blistered. Instead, He gives us a blessing. Hear me this morning. Grace reigns in the life of the believer. It reigns over our sin. God forgives us. You fell the Lord, you make your way down here. God will forgive you. He'll cleanse you. Why? Praise. It reigns over our suffering. And this morning, grace reigns. Make no mistake. Grace reigns over our service. When we get weary. When discouragement floods our hearts. It's grace that keeps us in church. Keeps us living for the sake. Yeah. When we are attacked, when we are mocked and persecuted, when we are misrepresented, when it seems like a friend cannot be found, that is grace. And the grace just helps us to keep in the battle. Someone asked me a while back, how can you stay in your church as long as you have? I said, it's just grace. It's just grace. This morning, you know what's going to keep you in church and keep you living for God? You say, I've got great discipline. Won't do it. You say, well, I have a great theological mind. Won't do it. You know what you better lean on? The grace of God. When problems and turmoil and sorrow and frustration, when marriage trouble comes, when kid trouble comes, when parent trouble comes, when church trouble comes, let me tell you what you better do. You better get, you better get off by yourself. And you better go beseech the Lord and ask Him for grace to keep you standing, keep you serving, keep you living for Him. And this morning, I'm grateful that grace reigns in our lives. See, it's grace that called us. It was grace that has shackled us to the Lord Jesus. And every time the believer drifts off a little bit, and if you're here and you're saved, if you've been saved any time, I don't you know this to be true. Any time you kind of drift off a little bit, God will pull on that chain of grace. Amen. Pull you back quick. Yeah. My God, man. Instead of saying, go on. You want to wreck it? You want to ruin it? You want to foul it up? Go on! No, sir. No, sir. God's grace. He begins to tug on us through that chain of grace. Amen. He pulls us back to Himself. Amen. I'm thankful for saving grace. Oh, but God's grace is so much more than just saving us. It's grace that takes care of us and blesses us. This morning, Mephibosheth is a type of you and me. When, when he met the king and experienced that grace, here's what the king said. He will eat at my table continually. From now on, he's got a seat at the table. Do you ever think about this? There's that spread laid out on, that ta on the king's table. I mean, man, they had everything you could want to eat. And there's old Mephibosheth. He's been cleaned up, but he's still lame. One of the servants had to take Mephibosheth, carry him over there, put him in a chair, and pushes him up to the table. And when he got pushed up to the table, he looked like everybody else. Yeah, you couldn't see that he was lame. 
God pushes, the king pushes him right up to the table. Now he can enjoy what everybody else is enjoying. And unless you knew Mephibosheth, if you walked in on that scene, you'd have no idea that he's laying. And this morning, that's what grace does. Pushes us up to God's table and allows us to eat in fellowship with the king. I'm thankful for grace. We're living in a day when people are belling out. Belling out on worship, belling out on their Bible, removing Baptists from their sign. They are replacing right music with uh, the wrong music. They are compromising at every turn. You say, well, how are we going to stay faithful? Great. Right. This morning, I'm just glad for that. Amen. Amen. This morning, maybe you just want to come and thank you for grace. It's got you through the hardest times of your life. And if you're having a hard time, it'll get you through yeah. this one. It was grace that saved you. And one day, one day, when it's all said and done, and I walk into that mini mansion city with a glorified body. All of the sin and sickness and sadness is a thing of the past. And I lay my eyes upon my king. It will all be because of grace. Why this world is facing the judgment of Almighty God, you and I are under a wave of grace. This morning it's grace that saved you. It's grace that's keeping you. God be thankful the grace of God as we stand. Father, I've done my best. I pray you'd take this word of frail and take the preaching. And Lord, I pray you'd use it for your honor and your glory. May we be reminded of the good grace of God, the kindness of God, the generosity of God. It is not rooted in who we are. It's rooted in who you are. Lord, while we enjoy and bask in the goodness of God, while we swim in a river of grace, while the waves of grace roll over us day in and day out, may we never be too busy to stop and say thank you. Lord, it ain't because of us. It's because of you. So thank you, Father, for grace. Thank you for your darling son that was willing to bleed and die so I could experience that grace. Granted, my fall was the fault of another. But my salvation is a result of another as well. And Lord, the reason I'm standing here saved on my way to heaven with peace in my heart is because of grace. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your blessings, your kindnesses, your generosities. Lord, it's all grace. Thank you for being good to us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.